Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. A few days ago, I told you about the poetry of Pablo Neruda. Today, I would like to approach the work of another great poet from Chile, who happens to be the first Latin American author to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. I am referring, of course, to Gabriela Mistral. I first read Gabriela Mistral when I was in college, so we are talking many years ago, and I made a mistake that I feel that many readers make, and that was to compare her in my mind as I read her to Pablo Neruda. I think that as a result of that I was not able to appreciate her poetry fully, and it was only now, many years later, that I actually discovered the treasures that she has to offer. So what do you say? Let's explore the poetry of Gabriela Mistral. Gabriela Mistral was born in 1889 in Chile, and she died in New York in 1957. Her real name, which I think is beautiful, was Lucila Godoy Alcayaga. But I also think her pseudonym is beautiful, because Gabriela Mistral combines the name of an archangel with the name of a wind, strong wind from France. And according to some people, it also combines the names of two poets that Gabriela Mistral admired, Gabriele D'Annunzio and Frédéric Mistral. Her life was really difficult. She had a tough life. And when I read about her biography, the sense that I got was that the first half of that life was marked primarily by poverty, and the second half of her life was marked by exile. She was a consul of Chile to diverse parts of the world. Two other important things. She was a teacher, and she was very proud of her Native American heritage. She won the Nobel Prize in Literature in the year 1945, quote, for her lyric poetry, which, inspired by powerful emotions, has made her name a symbol of the idealistic aspirations of the entire Latin American world. I really like that citation. I was really happy to read that. And you know what she did with the money? I think it's always interesting to, to check out when available, right, the information as to what the Nobel laureates did with the money from the Nobel Prize. What she did was that she bought her first property. As I told you before, her life was marked by poverty and by exile. So her first property was a very small house in Santa Barbara, California. That's what she bought with the money from the Nobel Prize. Now, since we're talking about her biography, I thought that I would read to you a description of herself that she shared in the 1920s. So this is when she was already an established poet. And this is what she said about herself. I am a Christian of total democracy. I believe that Christianity, with a deep social sense, can save the people. I have written as one who speaks in solitude, because I have lived very lonely everywhere. My teachers in art and life the Bible, Dante, Tagore, and the Russians. My homeland is a great one that speaks the language of St. Teresa, Gongora, and Azorin. Pessimism is in me an attitude of creative, active, and ardent discontent, not passive. I admire Buddhism without following it. For a time, it captivated my spirit. My scant literary work is somewhat Chilean because of its sobriety and rudeness. It has never been an end in my life. What I have done is to teach and live among my girls. I come from peasants, and I am one of them. My great loves are my faith, my land, and poetry." Great description of herself that I feel that really speaks for itself, right? Okay, let me tell you now about my approach in this video. Gabriela Mistral published only four books of poetry in her lifetime, numerous prose pieces. There was also a very important posthumous book of poetry. She is primarily known as a poet, of course, so that is what we are going to be focusing on. And what I thought I would do is, first of all, I would give you some general characteristics of her poetry as a whole. Then we can look individually at the four books, and I can give you a little bit of information about her posthumous books also, so that we can get kind of a panoramic view here of her output. And then finally, I do want to add a note on how her poetry sounds in translation in English, because I used a really, really good book when I uh, read her in English. It's this volume of selected poems translated by Ursula K. Le Guin. I think this really deserves a comment separately, because I was very, very happy with the experience of reading her in English, but I don't want to, you know, get ahead of myself. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when the time comes. So the first thing, let's look at some general characteristics of her poetry. I'm going to be throwing some adjectives at you that I feel describe her work. Uh, 
First of all, I would say that Gabriela Mistral's poetry is lyrical. Okay, you can get this also from the Nobel Prize citation. Many of her poems are meant to be sung. I would even say most of them. So it really goes back to that song-like quality of poetry. The second word I'm going to use to describe her work is traditional. And when I say traditional here, what I mean is that she was continuing the tradition of modernismo, which is not the same as modernism in English. Modernismo in Spanish is exemplified by the poetry of Rubén Darío. As she was heavily, greatly influenced by Rubén Darío, she liked that tradition and she continued it. But she was also not inflexible. Okay, At times when it came to expressing herself, she would always find her own ways of saying things, even when they did not adhere to the tenets of modernismo, for example. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this traditional but not inflexible thing, modernismo and all of this, is that at the time that she was producing her work, most poets in Latin America were going for some kind of an avant-garde expression. So I really admire her for not doing that. If everybody is finding a specific way, like the avant-garde type of way, to express themselves, but that doesn't happen to you know, reflect the, the way you feel and the way that you would like to express yourself, I think it really, really takes guts and it's a really brave move to simply go your own way, as, as the saying goes, even if that means being traditional at a time when it is not really popular to be traditional, and that's what she did. I would also say that her poetry is earthy. It's a very difficult word. Uh, I was very, very careful, and I chose it very carefully because earthy can mean many things in English. But when I say her poetry is earthy, I don't mean it is simple. Some people definitely perceive the poetry of Gabriela Mistral as simple. I don't think it is. I think it's actually quite complex. What I mean when I say earthy is that it is unpretentious. That's basically what I'm trying to say right here. If you look at her poems, many of them fit in one page. Okay, so some of them are long. She has long poems, but many of them fit in one page and they are very deep and very complex in themselves. I also found her poetry to be austere, and I would even say rough in, in some cases, but at the same time, to qualify that, it is also a poetry that includes much sweetness and much tenderness. Many of her poems actually fall into the lullaby category, and her second book of poetry, which is the one that includes the most of those types of poems, is actually titled Ternura, or Tenderness. So you see what I'm saying? It's kind of a balancing act in this aspect. And her poetry, finally, is also introspective. As a result of that, of that introspection, I feel that there's great empathy in her poetry and also a desire to protect. Now, we are talking now general characteristics, right? So this is basically like an Ars Poetica for her. And it just so happens that she put together at one point a Decalogue of the Artist. These were her Ten Commandments of the Poet. So I want to share some ideas with you from those, since it has to do with the way that she produced poetry. And one thing to keep in mind here is that I believe that when she was writing down these commandments, they were meant primarily for herself. So that's the context in which I read them. I think one of the things that I really like about her commandments or her Decalogue of the Artist is that she goes back to the idea of beauty. Most of these statements that she has have to do with the concept of beauty, that old idea that poetry should reflect or art should reflect what is beautiful. So I'm not going to read you all of them, but I wanted to share a few of them and some ideas from this. She begins by saying, you will love beauty, which is God's shade over the universe. That is number one. Number two says, there is no atheistic art. Very interesting statement here. Even if you don't love the Creator, you will affirm Him by creating in His likeness. Let's skip a little bit. Number six says, it will rise from your heart to your song, your poetry or beauty, and the former will have purified you. Number seven, your beauty will also be called mercy and it will comfort the hearts of men. Number eight, you will give your work as a child is given, taking blood from your heart. And I want to share with you the last one, number 10. You will emerge with a feeling of shame from every creation because it was inferior to your dream and inferior to that marvelous dream of God, which is nature. So I wanted to share those ideas with you and to kind of invite you to keep them in mind if you decide to explore the poetry of Gabriela. Mistral. So what do you say? Let's look at the books uh, individually and what they have to say. The first one is titled Desolación or Desolation. It's from 1922. If you look at the title, there's a really, really nice way of reading that. Desolation, right? The, you can look at desolation. And that sol means sun in Spanish. So desolation is like desunning. It's like when you don't have the sun. It's when you don't have light. 
this is a very dark book. And actually, in a little note at the end of the book, Gabriela Mistral, in a way, apologized for the darkness of this book. And she said something to the effect that there was going to be much more hope to come from her, that this was a dark period, maybe, or the reflection of a dark time in her life. Some of the poems, for example, were inspired by the suicide of one um, guy that she knew who was her ex-boyfriend. Now, the results of, of that, the effects on that, on Gabriela Mistral's personal life, I believe had been completely overemphasized. It's not like Gabriela Mistral spent the rest of her life thinking about the suicide of this ex-boyfriend that she had, nothing like that. I believe, and many critics agree, it has really been blown out of proportion. But it is something important that you see, you know, some poems in this book uh, reflecting or alluding to. Some of the poems here are about children. There's that desire for motherhood that is a theme that you can see throughout her poetry. Many, many religious poems, Christian, of course, in this first collection, because faith is really presented as a way of coping with suffering, with difficulties in life, for example, loss. Many of those poems, many of the religious poems could be interpreted or could be read as prayers. So it's, it's really deep, deep stuff that we find even in this first book. And in terms of the form, the form, I would say, is primarily traditional. You have meter, you have rhyme, all types of rhyme, consonant rhymes, assonant rhymes that are perfectly acceptable in Spanish. I'm going to share with you for each one of these books some poems that I think are, um, you know, important or worthy of mention. And all of these you can find in that English translation that I will tell you a little bit more about that I showed you before. So from this collection, I really liked The Strong Woman. It's a poem that I think is self-evident in its title about a very strong woman. There's another one titled Interrogation, and this one is related to that suicide of her ex-boyfriend uh, because she's asking God what happens to, to the souls of, of suicides. Poem of the Sun, S-O-N, right? So that desire for motherhood. And this one is actually um, dedicated to Alfonsina Storni, the great poet from Argentina, who was a very close friend of Gabriela Mistral. She was friends with Alfonsina Storni. She was friends with Juana de Barburu, the great poet from Uruguay, with Victoria Ocampo from Argentina. She was, you know, she knew many, many people who were in the literary scene in those days. And finally, I really liked the poem Sea Songs, which is really about heartache, about how do you deal with, with heartache, right? So that is Desolación from 1922. The next book that we have is the one that I mentioned before, Ternura or Tenderness. It's from 1924, so a couple of years later, and this is Gabriela Mistral's book of lullabies. This is the one in which you can see that type of canción de cuna, as we call it in Spanish. And I would say a couple of themes here to think about. This book is really marked by a sense of loss and also by that idea of protection that I was also telling you about before when we looked at some general characteristics of her work. But you're also going to find the celebration of everyday things. And this is something where I see one little part in which I see a connection to Neruda. If you think of Neruda and his elemental odes, there's definitely a great influence of Gabriela Mistral in Pablo Neruda. This is something that I feel needs to be said more. And if you remember in that previous video about Neruda, I told you that Neruda actually met Gabriela Mistral when he was a teenager, and she actually encouraged him in his poetry. There's an afterword to this work, uh, Tenderness, and in it, Gabriela Mistral emphasizes the importance of lullabies because she says that they are the first poetry that we actually hear, and she also describes them as a second milk. It's the second thing that we get from the mother, right? But there's also another wonderful way that she has of describing lullabies. Let me read you this uh, verbatim, the way that she describes them. She says a lullaby is a diurnal and nocturnal colloquy of the mother with her soul, with her son, and with the Gaia that is visible by day and audible by night. Even the description is poetic by itself. So from this collection, I want to highlight a few poems. I have here Rocking, that is a poem that is often anthologized, very, very short. Most of these are very short. Little Bud is another one that I enjoyed reading. Chile's Land, because she begins to talk about the land of Chile, which is going to become a more important theme towards the end of her work. Fear, this one is really good because it's um, a fear that a mother has 
for her daughter. She says, I don't want my daughter to be turned into a swallow. I don't want my daughter to be turned into a princess. And finally, in the third and last stanza, she says, I don't want her to be turned into a queen. The idea here is like, let these girls be who they are, right? Why do we need to turn them into anything? So that is fear. And finally, a long poem, so that's a rarity within the context of this book, Tenderness, which is the hymn to the tree. Trees are very important in the poetry of Gabriela Mistral. So that was her second book. Now we're going to talk about her third one, Tala, from 1938. This, I think many people agree, is probably her masterpiece. It features longer poems, more complex. Some critics have even described a few of them as hermetic, which is a very strange word to use in the context of Gabriela Mistral, but I think it's an accurate word. As I said, you know, I think her poetry is only apparently simple. Desolacion, Desolation, her first book was about frustration, but faith was present there. Now, if you look at Tala, her third book, probably her masterpiece, the faith here is much stronger, and at points she reaches even a type of mysticism. So you can see a, a difference there, a development from that initial stage up to uh, this third book. And I think it is here, in this third book, that you see the influence of Gabriela Mistral on Pablo Neruda, because here Mistral is really singing the beauty of everyday things. There's a poem about salt, there's a poem about corn, about air, about wind, about water, all of those elements, right? So it really made me think of the elemental oats. There are plenty of references to American myths and legends, and uh, American, I mean, I mean really American, like, you know, the, the American continent, that is a very, very problematic word. Don't get me started on that, maybe that's a topic for another video. But uh, let me share with you instead the poems that I found to be important or worthy of note from the collection Tala from 1938. And by the way, Tala is a talar, the verb talar means to fell trees, to cut down trees. If you look at uh, Ursula Le Guin's translation of that uh, title, she translated it as clear cut. So it's that idea of, of cutting down, right? So some poems from Tala. Two hymns, and the titles are Tropic Sun and the Cordillera. So it's about the sun and about the mountains many references to Native Americans and their culture in this one. Also, you find a lot of that in the next poem that I'm going to tell you about, which is the corn, right? Absence Country is another one that is often anthologized by her. It's about loss, it's about exile, and about death. It's El País de la Ausencia, the, the country of absence would be the literal uh, translation of the title. Another one that you, you're always going to find in anthologies by Gabriela Mistral is Four Queens. Todas íbamos a ser reinas, and this one is about shattered or unrealized dreams specifically of women, of girls, right? How they dream with being queens and, and how uh, life turns out for them. Another poem titled To Drink I thought was really nice. It's about quenching uh, thirst and uh, ultimately because of that I would say it's about gratitude, about the gratitude of having one's desires fulfilled. And finally another one that caught my attention is titled Song of the Dead Girls, which asks basically the question, where have these dead girls gone, right? So that is uh, some stuff that you may find interesting from Tala. And that brings us to her fourth book, which is titled Lagar, translated into English as Wine Press. This one is from 1954, so we are talking quite a few years later. And by the way, when she published the book, for example, in 1954, this doesn't mean that she wrote the poems in 1953 or 52 or anything like that. These were poems that were usually collected because she was very reluctant to publish. She edited a lot. And when she published something, most of the time it was because her friends kind of pushed her uh, to do that. So Lagar is a mature work, just like Tala, and it also contains some of Mistral's best work. I think the metaphor, the central metaphor, which is the wine press, is really wonderful because it's about dying in order to come to a new life, right? It's a religious metaphor also, the metaphor of the wine press. So I would describe um, Lagar as an amplification of Tala, the previous book, with many, many references to the loss of loved ones, many references to exile, for example, to fear, and also, as you might expect from the date, references to the war in Europe. 
it begins with a cycle titled Mad Women, and I think this is something that many people like to emphasize. I believe it has even been published separately as a cycle of poems, because these Mad Women, uh, they are just basically portraits or character studies of different types of women. So many people like to read this in a feminist light, and I think it really lends itself to some wonderful interpretation if you do that. I really think these uh, Mad Women poems are among Mistral's best work. So let me share with you uh, some great poems from Lagar. I really liked Deserted. This is about a woman who has been abandoned, right? About dealing with absence from that cycle of Mad Women poems. There's another one with the great title of Death of the Sea that I enjoyed very much. The Fall of Europe. This one is really about the war and it is uh, dedicated to Roger Queilloa. So, you know, you can see right there uh, more of her friends. She was in connection with them. She, she was also a friend of Stefan Spike. So j just to give you, you know, some, some names here that are important to her. A word, there's a poem titled A Word, which is about the things that we don't say and what can happen when we don't say the certain words. Then there's one titled I Sing What You Loved, and this is one that I would like to read to you, actually, so I'll come back to that in a minute. It's about longing and about waiting for the lover. Okay, so that is the theme of this great, great sounding poem. There are two poems that are very short. They fit into one page, titled Evening and Night. They're very melancholy poems that also have a great sound to them. And the last one that I wanted to highlight is Last Tree. So her poems about trees, as I said before, are just beautiful and I love them. So I wanted to include this one also as a poem that I enjoyed very much. There's one posthumous book that is very important and that I want to mention, and that is the Poem of Chile, the Poema de Chile. Le Guin, in her translation, actually calls it a dream journey, and it has characters and everything. So her, the protagonists of this poem are an Indian boy, a Wemul, which is a native animal to Chile, very important, and finally a woman who may or may not be dead. So look at these characters. This is just great, you know. The Poema de Chile is just basically about the land and its people. It is Chile in the form of a poem. That's the best way that I can describe it. And I would say if Pablo Neruda has his Canto General, then Gabriela Mistral has her Poema de Chile. It's just a delight to read. I have not read the entire thing. I have just read some selections that I found in anthologies. And from those, the ones that I wanted to highlight are her poems about the mountains. She has a great way of describing mountains. And a couple of poems in which you can see that are My Mountains and Mount Aconcagua. So I really like those. And I also li liked a couple more poems, one titled Bird Migration, because I, I am amazed by bird migrations. So I loved uh, this one. And the last one, I want to mention this very important poem titled Araucanians. So it's about the Araucanos, the native inhabitants of Chile. And remember, she had that Native American heritage that she was very proud of. And you can definitely see that there. So uh, we talked about the books. Uh, let's talk about Gabriela Mistral in translation, in particular in translation to English. Uh, I showed you before this book. This is the one that I experienced in translations by Ursula K. Le Guin. When I talked about Neruda, if you saw that video, I said that I had been basically heartbroken when I read Neruda in English translation. I would say something almost opposite happened to me when I read Gabriela Mistral in translation. The poems, the translations by Ursula K. Le Guin are just so brilliant that when I read Mistral in English, I really, really came to appreciate her poetry, actually. This is what happened to me. I read her for the first time, of course, in Spanish, and I was like, okay, great poet, and that was it, right? But rereading her in English actually made me want to reread her in Spanish because I felt like, wow, there's something that I didn't get when I read her in the original Spanish that I am getting from the translation in English. And I believe that that is a great sign. So I went back to her in Spanish, this time more carefully, and this time I read all of her poetry, all of the poetry that she had published during her lifetime. As a result, and inspired directly by that reading of Gabriela Mistral in translation. Le Guin, this is very interesting, she did not study Spanish. She was not fluent in the language. She says that mainly what she knew of Spanish she had learned by reading Borges, which I think is an amazing way to approach the Spanish language. And she actually gives us a lot of details in her introduction as to how she approached the translation. For example, something that she says is that she let the rhymes come to her 
when they wanted to come. So if the rhyme was not coming, then she didn't force it. You know, that type of thing was um, her approach to translation. And I think the result is just wonderful. As I said, it really inspired me to reread Gabriela Mistral, and I, I owe it to Le Guin. Uh, the fact that, you know, I was able to enjoy Gabriela Mistral thanks to her translations into English, because otherwise I don't think I would have had that desire to revisit her work in a systematic way, at least. Let me show you now some books, okay, by Gabriela Mistral. So, back in the day when I was uh, reading the Nobel Prize uh, winners, I've told you about that project a thousand times and I'm probably going to tell you about it 5,000 times more. This is the one that, that I got. It's an Antologia Poetica by the uh, publisher Edaf, so it's in Spanish, of course, and it has poems from all of her books, some uh, posthumous poems, unpublished poems. I think it's a, it's a generous uh, selection, and I really enjoyed it back in those days. Then there is this great collection by the Real Academia Española that you may have seen before. This is what it looks like uh, on the spine. Uh, the first one that they published as part of this series, for example, was Don Quixote. I think the second one that they did was Cien Años de Soledad. There's one for Rachuela, La Ciudad de los Perros, uh, Yo el Supremo, plenty of stuff. Uh, selected stories by Borges, selected poems by Pablo Neruda. So they have a volume of Gabriela Mistral. It includes the four books, uh, all of the poems from those books, then some prose pieces, and selections from Poema de Chile, from some posthumous works and all that. The good thing about those editions is that they include plenty of studies, plenty of essays by important critics. So you get not only the work of the author but also some approaches to that work. I showed you the one that I uh, read in English, so the Ursula K. Le Guin translation, which is uh, selected poems. I would say if you want to read Gabriela Mistral and you're gonna read her in English, go with this one, okay? With no hesitation. This is just an, an amazing uh, work. And then uh, my mother had a couple of books by her in Spanish. One of them is this one titled Prosa Religiosa, so Religious Prose of Gabriela Mistral. Very, very interesting. I was looking at the table of contents right here and I was just amazed by the, by the topics here. Uh, for example, uh, Christianity with Social Sense is the title of one of the, of the pieces here. My experience with the Bible, uh, Christian Unity, Catholicism in the United States. Uh, she has some essays about St. Thomas, about St. Catherine of Siena, St. Francis, uh, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, about Lourdes, right? So there are just plenty, plenty of uh, interesting things, at least to me. And the other one that my mother had is a book that Gabriela Mistral actually edited. It's a famous book, or at least it was famous at one point. My mother spent years uh, looking for this book, and we finally found it here in the US. <laughs> at one point, we couldn't believe it. Lecturas para Mujeres. So it was meant as a reader for young girls in school, and it has some great selections of you know, all types of works from all types of authors. There's work, of course, by Gabriela Mistral, but also, you know, Walt Whitman, Rubén Darío, Antonio Machado, all sorts of authors, Victor Hugo from, from France, things that are most of the time, you know, uplifting and life-affirming. So, you know, those are some books by Gabriela Mistral. So, bottom line, uh, the poetry of Gabriela Mistral is just rich and exquisite, okay? Le Guin criticizes the approach that compares her to Pablo Neruda, which is exactly what I did and something that I am quite ashamed of right now, because as Le Guin says, literature is not really a matter of competition. It's not a competitive affair. It's not about who is better or who is more famous or who is more prolific or who is more relevant. You know, I, I hate that word in, in this context right here, but it is often used. I think that poetry really demands our absolute openness. Okay, If we go to the work of a certain poet with a closed mind or with prejudices, we are just not going to receive as much. You know, it's like, like that song by Oasis says, you know, open up your fist or you won't receive. I think that's the approach uh, to take when it comes to poetry. So my advice, if you're planning to explore the work of Gabriela Mistral, is just Please, please forget about Neruda, okay? Just read Gabriela Mistral and don't make the mistake that I made. And I think that you are going to be pleasantly surprised. So, I promised you that I was going to read you that poem. So, let me look for it. And uh, actually, I have it in my phone. That's, I was going to spend hours looking for that. It's a lot. We have technology, you know? So, this song is, or, or this poem, it's a song too, is titled Canto que amabas. And the title in English is I Sing What You Loved. So let's see how I do this, okay? 
canto que amabas. Yo canto lo que tú amabas, vida mía, por si te acercas y escuchas, vida mía, por si te acuerdas del mundo que viviste, al atardecer yo canto, sombra mía. Yo no quiero enmudecer, vida mía, ¿cómo sin mi grito fiel me hallarías? ¿Cuál señal, cuál me declara, vida mía? Soy la misma que fue tuya, vida mía, ni lenta, ni trastocada, ni perdida. Acude al anochecer, vida mía, ven recordando un canto, vida mía, si la canción reconoces de aprendida y si mi nombre recuerdas todavía. Te espero sin plazo y sin tiempo. No temas noche, neblina ni aguacero. Ven igual, con sendero o sin sendero. Llámame a donde tú eres, alma mía, y marcha recto hacia mí, compañero. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? I'm always listening. Those were my two cents on the poetry of Gabriela Mistral. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.